to learn my alphabet and were worried that that would kind of stifle my curiosity around learning and reading. So instead I started learning at home with private tutors, my sister and other neighborhood kids to provide that social aspect and taking classes at my school district's homeschool resource center. So this is a picture of kind of what our little group looked like. We were very happy. We wrote all the time and we had the chance to do a lot of creative writing. And I was able to sit next to all these students who were sometimes years older than me and learn a lot from them. And I'm really glad that I had this freedom at an early age because I was able to learn so much and really advance in my writing, in my reading, in math and science in ways that I felt many of my peers who had a lot of worksheets and stuff to bubble in maybe did not get to do so much. Another great thing is that our teachers were extremely passionate about the subjects that they taught. Some of them were just right out of college and a few of our tutors were actually still in college. But the great thing was that this gave us the opportunity to learn from people who still knew what it was like to be students and were very empathetic to us as learners. And we got to learn very interesting things about subjects that I still remember. Everything from Mexican history, revolutionary history, to anatomy and art history. Which is why I know quite a bit about Emiliano Zapata as much as I do about George Washington. Um, although, of course, we learned about good old American Revolution as well. So that was a really awesome time for me to just be able to take in all this information about the world. Writing a lot. Um, you know, most kids probably learn SAT vocabulary with flashcards, but we would write poems and share them and try to guess the word involved. So fast forward a few years, and the seemingly perfect little school of ours kind of starts to dissolve when we move cities, and my sister Adriana decided that she wanted to try out public school in seventh grade, so she goes off to school. And I started taking online public school courses to accommodate my frequent traveling schedule because I would be teaching in many different countries around the world, uh, as well as at home with using video conferencing. And today I'm duly enrolled in public school and online school. So this is an arrangement that can be a little bit difficult at times to mesh with my extracurriculars because my extracurriculars are a little bit unusual. Um, you see, although I've spent less hours sitting in school than many students, I've probably been to more schools than a lot of my peers because of my teaching, and that wonderful opportunity has given me um, the chance to see a lot of the world, so that's been pretty awesome. But you might be wondering, how did I get started on this path of teaching in the first place? Because teaching doesn't seem like the most obvious career path for kids to just say, okay, I want to be a teacher, and just go and start traveling and giving presentations. Well, even though I'm going to be talking a lot about the new model of school, my teaching aspirations started in a very old school place with books of The Little House on the Prairie. Raise your hand if you've read any of The Little House on the Prairie books. Has anyone read Little House on the Prairie? Seeing some raised hands, woo! Yay! Uh, this is quite an awesome crowd then. So, I wanted to be a pioneer, just like War Angles Wilder. This was my Halloween costume last year, actually. I had my hat and my hair in braids and this awesome dress that I think has not been worn for a century. Anyhow, I was really into this whole pioneer mindset, but unfortunately, living in Washington State, you're about as far on the western frontier as you can really get anymore, and I think that you just sort of hit the Pacific Ocean after a while. So I was like, well, I can't really be a literal pioneer. But I found something very romantic and awesome about the way that teaching was portrayed in these books, how Lauren Wilder goes off to the One Room Schoolhouse, this is like in the last book of the series, and becomes a teacher. And I love the idea of being a teacher myself, since it wasn't quite so realistic to be a pioneer. Now, I was thinking all this at around seven years old. And this seems like a very strange thing to be thinking at seven years old because, as I mentioned earlier, teaching doesn't strike you as a very culturally or typically societally young thing to do. In fact, the Chinese word for teacher, Lao Shou, which is probably showing up backwards on camera here, uh, but the Chinese word for teacher literally means old master. So to be a young old master would be somewhat incongruous. But I got my opportunity to be exactly that a little sooner than I had expected. Along with my extremely long list of careers that I wanted to pursue, I wanted to be a writer. And I love reading and writing so much. And when someone told me in this nonchalant voice, oh, I don't really like reading and writing, my world sort of shattered because I was like, how is this possible? You know, this goes against all laws of life that I have previously known. So my teaching career began as a journey, a quest of sorts, to get every student to love reading and writing. I've been able to learn a lot over the course of this journey about teaching and learning, education, and technology. When I published my first book, Flying Fingers, um, when I was seven years old, along that idea of getting others to like reading and writing, to see how approachable writing was, I really had that goal in mind. And I know that it's a bit of a cliche to say, little did you know, but really, little did I know where all this would take me. 
Through this unique role as both a teacher and a student across many mediums, online and in person, small homeschool and large public school, I found that increasingly the diversity of our students and the wealth of information that we have at our fingertips really necessitates a new school model where learning is customized for each student, where we can really pursue different tracks, different interests, and have the support available for whatever it is that we want to do. In the good olden days, or maybe not so good depending on where you were, but I guess that good olden days if you were Alexander the Great, he had a tutor, Aristotle, who we know is the extremely famous philosopher, student of Plato, who is student of Socrates. And wealthy families would hire governesses and tutors, people like Aristotle, to teach um, in their family, and customization happened really naturally. So obviously it's maybe not so realistic to expect that every single student have their own Aristotle, but I think that we should really aspire to build a new model for school where every student can become one. Being able to question, think deeply, and have an impact that lasts long after we're out of school. Creating this idea for a new school really demands awareness of youth digital culture, what we're up to inside of school and out when we're on our computer screens or our tablets or our smartphones, and actively involving student voice and meaningfully implementing technology. So those are just a few of the key things that I'll be focusing on. Now to envision this new model of school, it's really pretty essential to understand where we as youth are coming from, what we're doing on our computer screens, our social connections on the internet. You've probably all seen like the horror stories in the news of how a team racks up $20,000 texting bill or things like that, but that's definitely not all of it, and that's really only a very small portion of it. So let's start off with a little fun pop quiz from Youth Digital Culture. FTW stands for... A. Feed the world, B. For the win, C. Forget the word, or D. Finish the work. So, um, oh, uh, it looks like my slides are backwards on camera, sorry. Okay, so the options are feed the world, for the win, forget the word, or finish the work. So raise your hand if you think it's A. Feed the world. Alright, raise your hands if you think it's B. For the win. Okay, seeing some raised hands, great. Raise your hand if you think it's C, forget the word. Okay, and raise your hand if you think it's D, finish the work. Okay, so pretty even smattering of hands across all those things, and I saw a few of you didn't raise your hands at all. Uh, that did not escape my notice. So, the actual definition of FTW, I think I, I saw most of the students got this right, for the win. So if you say, um, I did it for the lol, doing it for the lols, FTW, that means you're like doing something for laughs, for the win, like that's awesome, or um, this should be promoted. I'm not sure of a great way to define for the win, but it's just like, has a huge amount of win in it. So FTW, you'll see this a lot across um, whether it's texting and a lot on Facebook as well. What about YOLO? This is a word or a phrase, I should say, that's been circulating all the time on Facebook that I've seen quite a lot. Everyone's saying YOLO as a comment or in a post. So does anyone here know what the definition of YOLO is? You need to turn the microphone on for this. So um, let me just turn the volume up. Definition of YOLO. One person said, one person said, you only live once. Yay, you only live once, that's right, YOLO. Or if you're a cat, go nine times. That's another book stuff. Woo! Yay, okay, so FTW, YOLO. These are some of the terms that you'll be hearing really commonly if you're friends with a lot of teenagers or if you just really like to be cool and into what's going on. And FTW and YOLO are really sort of the new OMG and ROTFL, not because people don't use OMG and ROTFL anymore, but rather because so many people use For the Win and You Only Live Once, they've just been all across the social networks, and they've even spawned these digital memes that you can see all over Facebook. So to give a quick definition of a meme, it can be an image with some text over it that's been spread virally, almost the same way that some YouTube videos are, that are really instantly recognizable. And they usually have some sort of cultural background, some sort of reference to something, and uh, so those are memes. You can look a few up. 
And I think that really evidenced by the spread of phrases like FTW, YOLO, viral images for memes and videos, um, that we know that young people like my older sister Adrian and I can have a tremendous influence on the cultural landscape, on what even our elders are watching and seeing online. So you might already know about Rebecca Black's Friday, Friday, which um, I will not play, don't worry, was the video that got hundreds of millions of views, even more than the Super Bowl got actually this year on television, um, because it's one girl singing basically a really bad auto-tuned song, and people forwarded on and said, haha, this is so funny and stuff much worse. And what I think we really saw from things like Friday was that um, young people are being really influential, not just in our age group, but really across age groups. So what is the influence of this in education? Well, I think the one thing to think about is that whether we're looking at creating and sharing memes or making YouTube videos or watching them um, or becoming YouTube stars ourselves, we aren't waiting, sitting back and watching for what adults are telling us to make, read, or watch anymore, although you could say that we really never have. So as we strive to build this new school for our generation and the ones to come, I would like to think about this. How could we make learning as viral and as interesting to students, something that you want to forward on to your friends as much as we think of YouTube videos or memes on Facebook? What if we could use the connections of the online world to bring young people and their schools closer? One thing to realize is that while social networking, sure, is primarily about socialization and seeing what your friends are up to and connecting with them, that it's not necessarily just all about socialization. For instance, Facebook is often used as a sort of online study hall. Uh, my classes and many other classes around the world have their own groups on Facebook. So these are very informal, not very like school set up or school sanctioned groups where you can just write about what the homework was and how to do it, post resources and discussions, occasionally complain about assignments. And these are really great groups for students because suddenly we're able to take something that happened only offline, people getting together, calling each other up, and we're able to take it online. So we're on Facebook anyway, and suddenly people had the idea, okay, maybe we can bring something that we're doing our homework at night and combine it with something that we're on as well. And really this is a great thing, I think, because it's making learning more social. And it's expanding education's reach beyond just the six hours that we spend in school to really our afternoons and evenings as well. But much as I love these groups, it's still a relatively shallow use of technology compared to the huge potential that there is for online projects to give students more purpose in learning. And this to me is probably one of the most pressing and important foundations of the new school that we can create with technology. That is, a school where every student feels purpose in their learning. The urgency for this, I felt, was really highlighted. Today I was actually at school, and in my biology class we had this pretty fun project, I thought, where we would um, have these posters for ecology and writing about different biomes, so taiga and tundra and deserts and all this stuff. And our son was to go around, walk, and look at the posters and take notes. But the thing was, is that as we were doing this, I heard a lot of kids say, oh, when, I, when am I ever going to need to know who the producers are in the taiga in my career? Or, I want to be an engineer, I'll never need to know this. Or, I'm just writing stuff down, this is such busy work. And what I thought was, this is a um, clear example of where when the motivation, the motivation is going because the purpose isn't clear to the students. And sometimes it's important for us to be able to create our own purpose, but a lot of times the purpose can be because it'll be on a test, because you'll need it in the future, and it's not very clearly defined for students to understand. So this is where I feel that technology can really come in to give us a lot of real world examples. The purpose doesn't necessarily need to be, I'll use it every day in my job. Like, I study geometry not because I'm ever going to be um, teaching geometry or particularly being a mathematician, but because I want to really understand the world around me. And when I look at bridges, and when I look at houses and cathedrals, and all these different buildings, I see the tenets of geometry you know, come through in those, but most students don't have the opportunity to really see these real world connections and use technology meaningful, in a meaningful way in order to do that. So thinking about the assignments or the things that we do with technology as preparation for life can really put a different viewpoint on a lot of the things that we do in school. Um, if we think of everything that we do in school as preparation for life right now, then I think it would be accurate to say that it's a very strange life we're about to enter if it consists of a lot of A through E answers and a couple big projects that are worth 200 points, because I really doubt that life hands you a sheet with neat multiple choice on it all the time. 
So we know the problem, which is that very rarely do students get the chance to see something that they've learned put into action in the community or in their school. And this is something that we really need to change, giving students the opportunity to create positive good through something that they do, putting something that we've learned into action. What we do to help the world is usually like, in my case, extracurricular. So that's something that we should change. As a great example of what we can do when we have technology and when we can think about what we can do with technology and education, um, my friends Maya and Priya and I recently participated in this fun uh, contest sponsored by the Department of Education called Application for the Future. And the idea was, that, um, as part of this National Education Startup Challenge, that you would get together and think, how do I improve this aspect of education with something technology related? So our idea was that you would bridge the gap, that is the achievement gap, by building an app. So students could get together over the course of six months with expert technology mentors from relevant fields and learn enough technology skills to get together and build this app. Learning STEM and teamwork and all these different life skills through building this. Now, our entry was hypothetical, but I feel that this points to a big possibility for what can be done when we just use the tools that we have available, many of them for free or at low cost, and I know that some of you have a lot of technology implemented in your schools recently, um, and what we can do to give students the chance to build something and to see really directly how this math or this technology or this art that we're learning can be implemented in the real world. And I see this as really the new project-based learning. Because we've heard a lot about the awesomeness of project-based learning, which I totally agree with, but the problem with project-based learning oftentimes is that it's still one person who sees the project, and it still might end up in the trash can when the project goes home with the student. Um, so no matter how big and beautiful the poster is, or that diorama, it may not have enough of a lasting impact for students to really feel, okay, I contributed something to the world. I have this meaning in it. So when we, for instance, post a blog, or make a documentary that goes on YouTube and try to get views for it, or market an app on the App Store, we can really see very clearly, okay, this is how the wider world is reacting, and I need to take extra care because it's not one person, but it might be one million who are reading this. And I see the real benefits of this kind of, uh, you might say, peer pressure almost, this reaction to um, other readers of what you're doing from my own experience. Because in our school from, I mean, uh, that I went to when I was younger, we wrote blog posts almost every day about the topics that we were learning. And definitely, I took a lot of care to be very um, thorough with my proofreading, with my writing, and it helped me write tremendously. So this idea of using an audience to give students both impact and meaning in learning can be hugely powerful. As a great example, TEDx Redmond, the conference that I organize every year for young people, is completely organized, and uh, all of our speakers are youth, so 18 or under, a few 19 year olds. And this is our poster and our speakers from 2010 and 2011. It's been tremendously successful, over 700 attendees. And I think that a large reason for this is that students are really looking for an outlet where they can voice their opinions and uh, talk about meaningful things. So this is a perfect example of the intersection of technology and education as well. We use everything, Google Docs, Wikis, Skype, Twitter, um, Facebook to market the event, to post talks, to recruit speakers, and to find audience members, and we've learned so much over the course of this experience. Now what I find a little bit sad is that TEDx Redmond is an event that is happening outside of schools, and really schools sometimes need to be, um, in our local area anyway, need to be pushed a little bit to support this. And I think that this isn't something that necessarily needs to happen outside of school, and that it is, it is something um, that could really motivate a lot of students to take care about what they're learning and to see how what they're learning could be applied in the real world. So organizing an event that's around an educational topic, for instance, and giving the students the chance to be curators of information and content could be a huge motivator for really, I think, any subject. And another way to give us purpose and allow us to connect what we learn to the world around us can be found by encouraging us to share our knowledge and skills with others. I have a YouTube teaching channel where I posted over 500 videos, but it's not just me doing the teaching. There are great kids like Cameron Manor um, talking about science and germs and a hilarious YouTube video I encourage you to look it up, or Eva Reidenhauer talking about writing. Um, all these different kids on mathtrain.tv as well doing math. Um, all these different kids are talking about subjects that they have expertise on and teaching their peers. So when you give us the chance to really have that microphone, have that stage, not necessarily just offline, but also in the online world, again, we have that audience, and we have a greater sense of investment in what we're doing. 
I see this as one of the best things about the ease of content creation for youth like me today. Um, one of the best aspects of this youth digital culture is that a 14 year old or a 10 year old or a 7 year old, really any age, someone with a microphone and a webcam connected to the internet in their basement could be teaching the world. And this is something that we really need to harness inside our classrooms because I don't think that this needs to happen just outside of school. The trend of students making educational videos is really catching on. You can uh, look up videos like this and this on YouTube. And one other thing that is tremendous about this youth digital culture, the viral spread of things and how we can utilize Facebook to make education social and use these groups is that you can also cultivate student opinion about their own education and find great ideas from this. Um, so for instance, on facebook.com slash groups slash the student union, this group that I started, the student union, really collects all these different student opinions, very diverse. We have students who are really top performing in top performing schools, and we have students who are in um, special education programs in schools that need additional resources. So we really have students who run the gamut of different needs and different experiences, and we're able to get all these opinions shared because it's a very warm environment, very cooperative environment, and no one's scared to you know, agree or disagree. So the student union is a great example of where students are coming together and taking on no longer just a passive role, but really a more teaching role and a sharing role, which I find is pretty unusual and great. So students can do more than teach our fellow students. We can really take on a teaching role with our elders as well, our teachers, our parents, administrators. Technology provides a wonderful example of this. I've talked to a lot of teachers and administrators who say, well, I'm not sure about introducing these new technologies because I'm really not that great at using it. But this provides a perfect opportunity for students to jump in and help. I can recall this is an active board that I'm using, and in our school districts, um, every classroom almost has an active board. And a lot of times the teachers will actually ask the students for help in a very informal way, but it shows a great example of how students are willing to jump in when needed. Now imagine if you could really utilize the power of students in looking at technology, solving these problems, and give us the chance to be invested in our learning and have a sense of responsibility within our classroom, this could be a very perfect equation. And I, there are a lot of organizations like Generation Yes and Mouse Squad that are trying to make this happen, connecting students as almost the IT providers to teachers who need help with that. So we can put our expertise to really educational use. So I just wanted to show quickly a few of the really cool threads from the student union. And this is a discussion about what is a teacher. So I really like my friend Hannah's answer. She said, this is how I like to think of it. A teacher is somebody who is walking on a path, seeking understanding. A student comes along and asks which way to go. The teacher points down the path and they walk together. A lot of people assume the teacher is already at the end of the road, but I like to think that the road doesn't end. Now I would love to hear your opinions. What do you think a teacher is? Can you provide a definition of a teacher? And, well, now maybe you have a little empathy for students who don't raise their hands. <laughs> oh, one answer, perfect. Let me turn up the volume. Sorry. Okay. A teacher is a facilitator. Wonderful definition. Great. So we have teacher as facilitator. What are some other definitions of teachers? A learner. Did you hear that? Okay. Teachers are learners. Perfect. I love that. What a beautiful definition. A teacher is someone who learns as much from their student as the students learn from them. What an open-minded group this is. I'm so glad to hear your definitions of teachers. Um, I think that it works really nicely along the line. So Hannah's a student. That was her definition. 
Nikhil also had a, a definition of a teacher, which was a little more about the teacher's role. I guess they doubted you believed I succeeded, which I thought was pretty cool as well. So we're really seeing these different ideas for the role of a teacher. Now imagine this discussion like in the 1800s or in the 1500s. I don't think the answers might have been quite the same. This is really a testament to how far we've come about our definition of learning and teaching, as well as the role of information technology, the role of what we have now available at, um, you know, on the touch screens in front of us, how teachers aren't you know, pastors down to the information as much as facilitators, guides, um, people walking along the path with, with us, which I think is really um, beautiful and awesome. So, the power of the student union, this group that talks about education reform that gives students the chance to voice their opinions, really comes from the power of the fact that there are teachers, there are educators out there like you, who believe that students have a lot to teach. And so we have some wonderful educators who are members of this group. I would love to invite all of you to join and read what students are posting about their own educational experiences. Because this is a voice that we often don't hear from in the typical discussion around education, education reform that's on TV or the radio um, most of the time. So you can see really well-written, long responses on everything from history and how we need more international viewpoints and um, amazing, fun experiments and science to teach nearly everything, which I thought was maybe a little bit hard to do, but yeah, definitely worthwhile to look at. So there's a lot of this traditional, you might think of as teenage apathy, the eye rolling and the I don't really care disappearing when students have a platform, have a voice to share their opinions and are genuinely being listened to. The possibility for mobilizing youth involvement on a really tremendous scale is something that many organizations and groups are taking notice of. For those of you who heard of Coney 2012, the massive internet phenomenon um, from the organization Invisible Children, it ran into a little bit of controversy, but that movement really went viral. Raise your hand if you've heard of that one. Coney 2012. Seeing some raised hands? Yep. Yeah, probably a lot of you who are on Facebook, uh, friends with any teenagers, might have seen it really plastered across your news feeds. Everyone saying, watch this video. Look at this video. So that organization was somewhat controversial, but it really goes to show how an effective social media outreach can turn anything into a truly viral movement. Pony 2012 wouldn't have been possible without youth involvement, and it really goes to show what movements are we missing out on, what movements can we create if we have youth genuinely involved. So this is where I feel education can come in, creating movements, using social media, as well as the power of what we do in the offline world. Yet despite this great possibility for connecting with us and how we use Facebook, not just for chatting with our friends, but also for doing our homework, in my own personal experience, I've seen that a lot of schools are really restricted of internet use. Some schools actually, um, whose administrators I talk to at various conferences, have a list of approved websites which can be fairly narrow, and those are the only websites the students are allowed to access. Others turn off um, quite a lot of websites, a lot of personal blogs, a lot of social networking sites, because those are seen as possible distractions. And while I definitely see where this is coming from, I, would, I see the possibility more in a touch-the-stove approach. So what I mean by the touch-the-stove approach is that when I was very young, uh, two years old, I would always go up and want, I would want to touch the stove. My mom would say, no, don't touch it, it's hot, you don't want to go there, but I would want to anyway. So one day, she turned the stove down to the very low heat and she was like, okay, go ahead. I touched the stove, I did not get burnt, but I can assure you it was not pleasant and I did not want to touch that stove again. Even now, I'm 14 and I still have absolutely no desire to do so. So, in much the same way, my parents were fine with my older sister and I being on the internet from a very young age, and even making these ridiculous videos of us dancing and lip syncing and posting them to YouTube. You can imagine how embarrassing it is now for me, at 14, going through and systematically deleting or changing to private only about 300 videos. But I think that this experience of having been embarrassed by something will mean that I'm definitely more cautious about what I post online and I probably won't do worse things in front of a camera during spring break in college. So it's the touch the stove approach. I feel that a lot of schools are unfortunately saying, okay, the stove is completely off limits, it's boxed in when you turn 18, the stove is open. So that was sort of a strange analogy, I know, but from my own personal experience, 
I think they're really giving students the chance to explore and equipping us with the tools to understand why certain things aren't as reliable, why certain things aren't as credible for sources, um, giving us those research and journalistic skills to identify biases online can be a lot more valuable in the long term than simply having a very strict filter. Great example comes from Esther Wojcicki, a teacher at Palo Alto High School in California, and she teaches her students exactly that. They have this really comprehensive school newspaper called the Campanile, and the students who are involved in this journalism program use all the different facets of the internet, but they also learn what is credible, how do I identify, is this source really good to use. I don't think that these are skills that should be limited to a journalism class. They're really skills that are essential for all of us in the 21st century. Now, most people would be a little bit wary of letting a five-year-old explore on the web, but that was precisely what my parents let my sister and I do. And as a result, we were able to discover some of the most amazing educational resources out there on BBC Kids and PBS and Smithsonian and all these awesome websites. It's why I really began to write and be, be so invested in it, because I was writing blogs and, and seeing that what I could write would have an impact beyond just my house, beyond just my limited audience of three members of my family. So if we could take such a more open approach, one that emphasizes long-term values of evaluating things and seeing if they're credible and apply this in more schools, I think that we could have a really great way to move forward in uh, internet use in school. So we have these tools at our disposal, waiting and ready to go. The ideal new school really isn't going to be just the monolithic experience of going to a building, staying there for seven hours, six hours, taking all this information, doing homework, going back. I think that it's going to be a patchwork of many different opportunities, formats, people, relationships, online and off. So as we think about the new school, there's also a really philosophical undertone to my thinking about this topic um, around student voice as well. So take a look at these three images. And I want to ask, which of these looks most like your average typical school? So we have A over here and B over here, and C over here. So which of these looks most like the average typical school? Raise your hand if you think A. Okay, raise your hand if you think B. All right, raise your hand if you think C. Okay, most everyone's raising their hands, great. So the problem is, is that C isn't a school. It's actually an image of a hallway in the Robben Island prison in South Africa, the same one where Nelson Mandela was held captive for 20 years. And I feel that when the schools that we go to every day look more like hallways in prisons than libraries or cathedrals, we have a bit of a problem. And it's about more than just looks. You see, a prison imprisons people. And the old school that many students, many of my peers go to every day, imprisons learning. Treating learning like it's something that we can only do within certain confines, within seven hours a day, five days a week, is not the right approach to take because it really puts bars and walls around something that should be limitless. Now we have so many different sources of learning and are in the ability to liberate learning from being confined to four walls and a whiteboard. Creating lifelong learners starts with the understanding that our world is the best classroom of all. Teachers can come from all places and be of all ages. They can be people like the tutors I was privileged to have growing up, or young people like myself, Cameron Manor, Eva Reidenhauer, the kids on MathTrain.tv who are making videos to teach their peers. They can be people like Sal Can, whose CanAcademy.org has over 3,100 teaching videos. They can be people like the students in your classrooms who could maybe share a bit about technology expertise or what they see happening in youth digital culture and its ramifications for how they learn. So when I think of the ideal new school, I ask questions. What if the schools that we see, the school that I go to, what if it looked more like a library, an open space, acting as a portal to knowledge and discovery, or more like a cathedral, not in the religious sense, but rather in inspiring students to look further and learn with purpose? Realizing the power and potential of harnessing youth digital culture, the way that we're making education social on groups on Facebook, seeking perspectives on uh, education issues from students, 
and ensuring that everything we learn has authentic purpose. These are the actions that we need to take in order to ensure that we're able to really journey ahead in technology and education. I heard some amazing definitions of what a teacher is from this audience. Um, the teachers are those who are willing to learn from students and who do learn more from their students, which I think is awesome. I truly believe that teaching and learning is a two-way street. But unlike on the real street, there's no driver's age requirement. I've been able to learn this from my teaching and learning from others who are both older and younger than I am. But I know that many students will never have this opportunity when they go to school. So this is where your chance comes in. You all have done so much to teach my generation. And now I highly encourage each of you to think about where someone like us, someone like me, someone like the students who go into your classrooms would be able to teach. After all, it is only when we know how to learn that we really know how to teach. So that's, those are my ideas for what the new school can look like, how students can play a role, and hopefully how technology implementation can go a little smoother with the help of students. And I would love to take any questions if there's some time. like a more visual zooming moving PowerPoint in some ways. It's uh, online, Prezi.com. Um, for my notes, I'm using a Kindle Fire. So you can tell I'm, uh, I'm a really definitely a big reader because I have a Kindle as opposed to an iPad. So yeah, Kindle. <laughs> no, Amazon is not paying me. And for Skype, I have Skype over here, Mac over there. This is a PC. And yeah, so that's pretty much the roundup of all the technology I'm using. Oh, and I'm also using, sorry, New Tech TriCaster um, hooked up to a HD camera for the live stream feed. So yes, quite a bit of technology. standardized testing may be really negative this particular week as a result. Um, my thing about standardized testing is, it might have been reflected earlier in my speech, um, is that I feel like it's not a very good way of preparing us for the real world in the sense that life very rarely hands you a sheet with A through E multiple choice questions. I feel that a better way to look at how we can prepare students for critical thinking would be really asking students to come up with the questions and making the questions about maybe things that we see more in real life. So for instance, what if like, we could get professional authors and writers to actually come and speak to students about um, you know, analyzing literature as opposed to maybe just some interpretations. I've taken AP Lit, so yeah, this is probably a personal bone to pick of mine. But yeah, I think that we really need to look at uh, having more real world scenarios for students to experience, having students be able to ask the questions and maybe relying on it a little bit less as a way to kind of sort students into different categories of competence. Bye.